think about I is really important about branch chains is where's our order limitation so we do know that with uh, diets containing meat animal byproducts meat products that you know isoleucine can become fourth limiting on plant-based diets we see valine and so uh, really feel like it <clears throat> felt like it was important to really start the next step was for isoleucine, mm -hmm. we were in a plant-based type diet, all veg diet. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast where we talk about the latest developments in poultry nutrition research and industry trends. I am Sam Rochel, one of the co-hosts of the podcast. And I'm an associate professor of poultry nutrition at Auburn University. Um, I'm joined today by a guest who was one of my first mentors, or was my first mentor in, in poultry nutrition, uh, Dr. Bill Dozier, who was my major professor uh, for my master's program uh, here at Auburn several years ago. And so very uh, excited to talk with Dr. Dozier. Uh, the topic will be around branch chain amino acids. Uh, Dr. Dozier uh, worked very early on uh, when the excitement was building around L3 anine and, and how that could be applied into broiler diets. Ultimately, did a lot of work around uh, valine when he was at Mississippi State and then uh, has since uh, more recently worked on uh, some work around isoleucine, which we'll talk about today. So, very excited about the conversation. Uh, Dr. Dozier, how are you doing today? Thank you, sir. I'm doing great. Good. Good. Uh, yeah, uh, really, really appreciate you joining. And I look look forward to the conversation. Um, you know, I kind of gave a, a, a brief background, but uh, can you just kind of talk a little bit about the evolution uh, of, of feed grade amino acids? Because, you know, you you kind of really were instrumental in, in some of the key players who were working in this area uh, as we move from just using methionine, the lysine to, to further limiting amino acids. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, back probably in the early, really in the late 1990s, uh, we were really looking at uh, the opportunities that with L3 and uh, at the time that was really not being used commercially. I think there was one uh, field trial that was conducted at Choctaw Made over in Mississippi with Dr. Chevy Rao. And uh, so, uh, did work with NutriQuest with Dr. Michael Kidd and Dr. Brian Kerr, and I uh, was doing some of this with a PhD project I had with Dr. Moran. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was really some of the star, uh, forefront of really uh, L3 anine supplementation and broiler diets. And uh, so uh, that really went successful, you know, <clears throat> in terms of. Uh, over the years and with any amino acid, it takes time to get momentum. And, uh, you know, we really started to see this after several years, uh, you know, I completed my degree in 2000 and then we really started to see it catch on probably 2007, eight, you know, we really saw, saw a lot of this moving forward. And then kind of behind that threonine was a fourth limiting amino acid valine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started working on some of that work with uh, <clears throat> Genomoto, uh, with Dr. Corzo and Kidd at Mississippi State and Starkville. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> again, uh, you know, this was like between 2004 and 2008. And then uh, once I started here at Auburn in eight, we still continued some of that l valine work. And uh, and it's as you know, it's caught on quite well now, particularly with the all veg diets. I really think that the antibiotic free all veg type diets really parlayed some of that movement in terms mm -hmm. of uh, valine because it's clearly fourth limiting. The thing about I is really important about branch chains is where's our order limitation? So we do know that with uh, diets containing meat animal byproducts, meat products that, you know, isoleucine can become fourth limiting on plant-based diets. We see valine. And so uh, really feel like it 
<clears throat> felt like it was important to really start the next step was for isoleucine. Mm -hmm. We were in a plant-based type diet, all veg diet. It was clearly force limiting. Uh, then if, once we <clears throat> exceed about three per percent, three or four percent animal byproducts, then we, you know, isoleucine is clearly force limiting. And so then you have some co-limitation going on with uh, some meat products in the diet that's probably less than say three, four, less than four percent. So looking at the literature at that point, uh, while here at Auburn, I really saw that there was uh, some data out there with uh, isoleucine, but mm -hmm. it was up to a, a bird approximately one kilogram in body weight. So. And a lot of the data was approximately about 15 years old. So, and we did, we do know this from some previous work that isoleucine uh, really plays a key impact on breast meat yield. And so we set out with uh, a master student I had here, uh, Tanner Weiss, and uh, to really design Tanner's program of looking at digestible uh, isoleucine ratios uh and from one to four kilograms in body weight so we look by the way like three separate experiments uh 21 to 35 days was a was an early experiment and then the uh middle one was 21 to 40 uh, 28 to 42 and then the third one was 35 to 49 days of age trying to target that four kilos in body weight we're at 42 days of age on the that second experiment. We were right there at three kilograms in body weight. So mm -hmm. really wanted to define uh, these ratios with some, uh, uh, with a modern bird that really uh, extended out to three and four kilograms in body weight, particularly to try to capture this big uh, <clears throat> modern bird with uh, optimizing breast meat yield so yeah it, as you mentioned you know one thing you have to be very careful with when you start talking about isoleucine is potential you know co-limitation with valine and then also you getting close to arginine too so can you talk a little bit about diet formulation in those projects and, and what you did there to ensure because i think one thing that's really nice about that paper is i mean you uh, there was a lot of work that went into the ingredient analysis, you know, getting uh, as, as correct as you could or close as you could possibly get on, on diet formulation. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how you set that up? You know, the number of levels is, is uh, very good in that paper. Um, and so that the whole the whole approach is, uh, I think, of, makes it for a very strong set of of titration and those things like simple things, but from experimental design for a dose response, that's those details are very important. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, that's very, very important, Sam. I mean, to, to, to start with, uh, we really looked at uh, some, had to include some blood sales in those diets to mm -hmm. uh, drive down isoleucine. So we have, so we can work with a very de deficient diet. So uh, uh, that was uh, one of the first things that we uh, really did was trying to uh, look at that. And these were primarily corn, soybean meal based diets uh, with, uh, we did have, as I said, some uh, blood meal, uh, mm -hmm. I believe in the blood cells in these diets. So uh, uh, we did, uh, you know, <clears throat> also was very important was keeping the adequate amounts of uh, valine uh, trip as well as arginine and uh, also uh, use glycine uh, particularly uh, early on in, in some of these formulations uh, in terms of bl blood cells we tried to keep this low so we're looking at two two and a half percent but just mm -hmm. trying to keep a deficient diet uh, to start with and then we could titrate uh, isoleucine to that uh, and by doing so we first started out with about seven different titration levels and we and with the first experiment and then look had to really evaluate that in, in terms of 
you know, you get into a, a linear response or it's mm -hmm. quadratic. And then I believe on some of those latter experiments, we added, I believe, an additional treatment to try to capture more of a quadratic response. And so. So can you give a little background? We have a lot of graduate students who are, you know, just getting familiar, I think, uh, with these concepts that watch this, this show. Can you talk a little bit about the importance and, and kind of where you start and where you end when you're doing a, an amino acid dose titration? And now, that's a very, that's very, very important, Sam. Uh, so obviously, I mean, when we're looking at a de deficient diet. So say on that test diet, I like to see a diet that's approximately about 75% of where I think maybe the break point may occur or where that uh, proposed requirement may end up. Mm -hmm. And then on a summit diet, which is on the upper end, I like to see about 130% of that requirement of where I think we may end up on a break point uh, before we start the research. So, so that we can get ice really uh, from a deficient to where that till we reach that requirement we've got a, a really good slope mm -hmm. and we've got a few points there to create what i call that tail beyond that requirement is very very important elevate bird well-being and improve profitability with cargill's tailored nutrient solutions that deliver performance Cargill is leading through applied nutrition, leveraging deep nutrient insights and understanding of the animal's nutrient requirements to achieve your production and performance goals. We appreciate the insight. Thanks again for your time and thanks to you all for listening. And uh, we appreciate you following the show and, and look forward to the next one. Thanks and have a great day. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.